Good evening. My name is Bob Lynn, and I am the uh, labor coordinator for the National Infrastructure Bank. I am also a retired union organizer for the Plumbers and Pipefitters, Local 50 in Toledo, Ohio. And I'd like to welcome everyone here today to our webinar uh, entitled <clears throat> Standing on Giants. Uh, a salute to the presidents in our past who have made a great contribution to our country. Uh, today, as we go through this, we're going to uh, have several presenters to talk about uh, George Washington slash Abraham, Alexander Hamilton and the bank uh, that was uh, created at the founding of our country. And then we will talk about Abraham Lincoln and uh, what he had to overcome when it came to the Civil War to be able to uh, structure uh, the finances of the United States. And finally, we will talk about uh, FDR and what uh, he was able to do in order to rescue the country from economic um, catastrophe with the Great Depression and also helped to be able for us to be able to win World War II. We have a distinguished panel of guests and without further ado, we're going to move on to that. And I'm gonna ask Alfeka Mutardi, who is uh, <clears throat> a former senior economist with the IMF and currently the macroeconomist for the NIB coalition. So Alfeka, if you wouldn't mind explaining the bank a little bit uh, so that uh, everyone has an idea of what we're talking about here uh, before we get too far into it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as uh, Bob Lynn has mentioned to you, we've had several infrastructure banks in our nation's past. And I'd like to talk to you about today's current version and iteration of it, um, which works exactly like the banks of the past. Uh, this happens to be a piece of legislation that is currently in the Congress. Uh, it's called House Resolution 6422. And what this piece of legislation would do would be to create a four, soon to be $5 trillion public bank to lend only for infrastructure all across the United States. The legislation was introduced into the 116th Congress by Representative Danny Davis from Illinois. Um, the, uh, uh, since that Congress ended uh, back in December, it's, uh, we're working on getting the legislation reintroduced. Uh, and this time around, uh, when we do that, we're going to actually raise the size of the bank to $5 trillion. And, and where did that number come from? Actually, that's the estimation of the American Society of Civil Engineers, who say that of all of the financing available in our country right now, uh, there is a shortage of $3 trillion, one in for uh, roads and bridges, one for uh, water infrastructure, and then the third trillion is for a combination of other things. And then in addition, we wanna have a bank that's large enough to cover high-speed rail, um, uh, broadband um, and, and affordable housing and some other large projects. This bank will, this iteration of the bank will work uh, just like uh, Alexander Hamilton's first bank in the United States. It will be uh, capitalized using uh, existing treasury debt held by the private sector. And then when it gives out loans, it will give out loans in the same manner as any commercial bank gives out a loan, uh, but only for infrastructure projects. And we have a great uh, list of, to get started with of projects that are, uh, that are sitting in drawers of um, different uh, capital authorities uh, waiting to get started, uh, road projects, uh, high-speed rail projects, uh, water projects, uh, a long list uh, that we can get started with. Uh, and we really think that by having a concerted effort to rebuild our infrastructure, we can supercharge American economic growth and we could really help to get people back employed in great paying jobs that pay Davis-Bacon wages. Uh, the, the inputs into the infrastructure will be by America only. And we will really think this will help our economy and uh, um, dr be a driving force to uh, improving us both in the short term and the long term. So now we're gonna hear from our other speakers on um, how these past presidents um, uh, had infrastructure banks that built almost all of our nation's infrastructure. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Jack Hanna. And Jack is uh, <clears throat> currently a, an Oregon Democratic Party State Central, Central Committee person and the former treasurer and interim chairman of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. Uh, he's going to uh, discuss uh, in a little bit greater detail 
Alexander Hamilton's first iteration of the bank. So Jack. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good evening, everyone. The United States today faces an economic crisis similar in many ways to that which our founding fathers did back in the, in the 1790s. Today, we face a reeling economy with unemployment at an actual rate of about 10%. A third of our small businesses are likely to not survive the pandemic. And state and local governments are laying off millions of its employees due to, to diminished uh, tax revenues. We also have a situation where poverty is increasing uh, that's also connected to a lack of health care. We have economic inequalities where one in seven children in the country are going to bed hungry at night over the last week. And we have increasing economic disparities along with climate change and globalization being major challenges to our government and economic development. Add to that, we have an eroded national infrastructure that has been ignored for the past 60 years. In the 1790s, our country faced similar serious problems. George Washington was president of a new country that had recently been at war for its creation. The details of how the states and national government would operate and function were still being negotiated and resolved. The infrastructure of the country had to be developed and expanded if the country was going to be successful economically right, and survive. In addition, there was a huge amount of debt that was incurred as a result of the war approximately 75 to $80 million. And it was owed by not only the national government, but also by the states to not only domestic, but also foreign leaders, uh, lenders rather, a huge amount. George Washington had a very close relationship to Alexander Hamilton, who was his chief of staff during the war and a financial and political genius among other abilities. Washington, in composing his first administration, named as his Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was up to the task, and it obviously was a big one. What he did was he conceptualized and then articulated uh, the National Bank of the United States. In doing so, um, his effort uh, and focus of attention was first to address the debt that the country had acquired, which, by the way, uh, no interest was being paid upon. It created a crisis of confidence that uh, lenders within the country and overseas uh, 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 were on the verge of stopping to support in any way or fashion, the government as it was uh, operating at that point in time. Hamilton uh, decided that he needed to conceptualize of the bank and he wrote in order to support that idea, a report to Congress. As a matter of fact, he issued four reports to Congress that related to the bank and to the, uh, uh, the development of the economic system that, that much of which exists today. The first report was um, uh, 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 for the purpose of funding and uh, uh, creating the assumption of public debt. In that uh, report, he described uh, how he wanted to collect uh, <coughs> excise taxes and tariffs to use to pay uh, 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 the interest obligations that the loans that the country had acquired uh, back first. Then he assumed uh, uh, in the report that all the debts of the states uh, would be uh, combined and assumed by the national government uh, in order to create confidence both domestically and in, uh, with foreign countries as far as uh, 
uh, the economic system that uh, we had uh, that was being created. Then he issued a second report on public credit and he uh, described how the bank was launched and funded. Uh, the bank in 1791 was created by the Congress and capitalized uh, with $10 million that was a sum greater than all the banks in the country at the time. And that was done in one day. And the reason that it happened so quickly was the concept and the confidence that Alexander Hamilton engendered with regard to his reports that he submitted to Congress and to the public, created that confidence where people were ready to invest in our new country. Uh, ha Hamilton offered uh, holders of the newly organized debt instruments uh, the opportunity to invest in the bank. Uh, they could buy shares through uh, one fourth of specie, that is gold and silver or coin, and then three fourths of new government bonds. They would be paid a regular interest rate higher than that on their debt, all federally guaranteed. The interest on the newly minted government was paid to the bank. The value of the currency was regulated uh, nationally by the bank and its investment in the new uh, productivity created confidence in the country and its economic system that was emerging. Credit from the bank became the engine of economic growth for the country. As a result of uh, the bank's investments in infrastructure, 20,000 road, miles of roads were developed. Uh, our manufacturing base was launched and we began to build dams and canals that were constructed all over the country. And last but not least, the bank turned a profit. Quite a success given from where uh, circumstances began uh, to the end of the bank's uh, operation in 1811. It was chartered for 20 years from 1791 to, eight, uh, to 1811. Unfortunately, uh, it was not renewed until five years later because of opposition, because of landed aristocrats and plantation owners. But it survived and uh, 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 went on to have three different iterations subsequent to this. The third and the fourth uh, reports that Hamilton provided Congress were uh, the third, a report on manufacturers, which again emphasized and strengthened the whole concept of a national bank uh, supporting the economic development and the infrastructure of our country. And the last but not least report included in it uh, a defense of the constitutionality of a national infrastructure bank. Um, there are those today that may have some suspicions as to its legitimacy, but Hamilton addressed those. It was affirmed by the Supreme Court about 20 years thereafter um, in a, a great decision um, uh, 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 that uh, included as its rationale uh, that which Hamilton uh, uh, used to justify um, the creation of the bank uh, implied powers of the Constitution. A huge accomplishment from beginning to end, even after Hamilton had passed away, uh, uh, the remnants of his work and effort uh, survived up until this day. Uh, we were very uh, fortunate to have uh, founding fathers of the quality of, of um, George Washington, who had the confidence that he did in Alexander Hamilton, a great economic genius and patriot. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for that. Uh, next, we're going to ask Ellen Brown, uh, who is the founder and chair of the Public Banking Institute and author of 12 books, including Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution. And before we get to that, before we get to Ellen, though, the one thing I will say is that uh, if you have any questions, we, we have every intention of trying to get to as many questions as possible. We'd ask that you put them into the Q&A section on your screen. Uh, that way we can go through them and make sure they get answered. Uh, I see 
there are several people who have their hands raised. Uh, instead of that, please put your question in the Q&A and we'll make sure that gets done. So Alan, if you could just share with us uh, your ideas and, and understanding and, and expertise in public banking and how our system works and how this can uh, all come together. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I would go back a little farther even than the constitution. Uh, the American system versus the British system, uh, the, the American system is basically uh, sovereign credit and sovereign money. In other words, we do not need to be depend. We do not need to borrow from other countries. We can issue our own credit through our own public banks, and um, that goes back to the American colonists in uh, 1691. Massa the governor of Massachusetts needed to fight a border war, and he didn't have any money for it. So he um, he got the idea to just print these little paper receipts or paper script that were really credits on the colony or credits on the GDP of the colony. It was basically saying to the soldiers, we recognize that you have given service to the colony and uh, we will honor these, this, this, these receipts for your performance. So that it's, you know, people always talk now about fiat money and it's not backed by anything, but it's actually backed by something. It's backed by the GDP and the labor that it's paid for. So it's a, a medium of exchange exchanging value for value. So that was a brilliant system that um, um, I think it was Robespierre, somebody in France was recommending about how, how amazing it was that, they, that the colonies had, had taken off when they didn't really have any funding and they basically funded themselves. And that worked very well. The, actually, the northern colonies printed too much um, because it was easier to put the money out than to bring it back in taxes. Uh, so, so in Pennsylvania, they, the Pennsylvania, uh, the governor of Pennsylvania created a land bank, so created a bank. So it was a more sustainable system where instead of just putting the money out there and putting more and more out there, they put it out as a loan and it would come back uh, with a modest interest less, well, there weren't, it's not like there were banks on every corner anyway, but it was, um, and five percent interest versus, I think it was eight percent at the Bank of England. But it's not like you had a Bank of England on the corner anyway. So that that not much was happening in Pennsylvania until, until they came up with this system, and then all of a sudden it was very productive, and became the leading producer of that area. So this was a sustainable system where the money went out and it came back. Um, pro it came back from what was produced by the money itself. So those are the same sort of self-funding loans that um, were used by Roosevelt well on, the, on this same model. So anyway, then of course, King George said we couldn't do it anymore. And some historians say that was the major trigger of the American Revolution, which we funded with paper receipts again, with our own internal funding, and even though it went to zero <laughs> by the end of the war, Benjamin Franklin said, isn't it amazing that we, uh, that we were able to beat the world's major power, which was England, the UK, or England, I guess, um, with no money, with just this, these paper receipts that we printed ourselves, like play money, essentially. He didn't say play money, but you see that, I mean, it was amazing, even though it went to zero, and it didn't go to zero because they were overprinting. They were actually quite conservative in their printing. It was the British that were counterfeiting it. I, I don't have time to go into the whole history, but it's pretty interesting. Anyway, um, so then we had the first U.S. bank and the second U.S. bank set up on the American system as opposed to the British system. So in England, the Bank of England was funded in six, or founded in 1694, which was a private bank, privately fund, or private investors who lent money to the king. So we had our own public bank that lent money and was able to create sovereign credit. Of course, by the time we got to the second US bank, it was 80% privately owned and Andrew Jackson thought it was corrupt. And you know, the, there's that whole history, history. Then we went through a period of, after he shut down the second US bank, we went through a period of, um, um, where you just had a lot of different banks that were issuing uh, 
credits or issuing bank notes for gold that they didn't really have. So we had a very unstable system. We had no national currency. So Lincoln was faced with 30% interest rates from the British, British bankers, which were too high. And apparently one of his advisors said, you know, you don't really have to borrow that money. You could just issue your own like the American colonists did. So that's what he did. He issued, uh, he actually doubled the money supply doubled the money supply. I mean, if we did that now, we'd be talking about like another $15 trillion or more. I'm not sure what the money supply is now. So, and it did not create inflation. Even Milton Friedman said it did not create inflation, that, that it was, there was less inflation during the uh, civil war than dur during other wars. There's always some inflation due to shortages, et cetera, but it wasn't from putting too much money out there. So they put this money to good productive use including building the Transcontinental Railroad, which was highly productive. And we had a very productive economy after that until after Lincoln was shot, of course, the Greenbacks were withdrawn or the, no, they, anyway, that system was shut down and um, silver was demonetized. Prior to that, gold and silver could be used as reserves by the banks. So they demonetized silver, which was the money of the people. And so we went through another depression and we wound up with the Federal Reserve, which is also more on the British system than the American system because it's uh, composed of 12 branches, all of which are 100% owned by the, by the uh, banks in their district, private banks in their district. And uh, so Roosevelt was faced with this major depression and he would have liked to use the Federal Reserve to to be, they were supposed to be industrial banks, but that, I, that didn't happen. So he used the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and said, and uh, which had been set up by uh, the previous president. And, um, but it was set up as a banker's bank. And so Roosevelt used it as an industrial bank or a bank to uh, fund development all across the country. And I don't, not sure how much of all this you want me to go into. I didn't, um, for, for right now, I think that that's a good start to be able to do that. Uh, and uh, we're definitely going to come back to you because uh, we have a few things that I think are important that you will be specifically able to address. So thank you for that. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to have Carl Holland uh, talk to us about uh, Abraham Lincoln's iteration of the bank. Uh, and and it, the floor is yours, Carl. All right. Well, um, well thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so what does Abraham Lincoln have to do with the National Infrastructure Bank? Um, well, a lot actually. Um, when most people think about Abraham Lincoln though, we usually think about things like uh, the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, maybe Frederick Douglass and his role in pressuring Lincoln, Lincoln to uh, free the slaves amidst the Civil War. But um, one of the things that um, a lot of people don't realize is that when Abraham Lincoln ran for president, he campaigned on expanding infrastructure and he campaigned on establishing a national bank. Um, he actually uh, was a protege of uh, Senator Henry Clay and of uh, former President John Quincy Adams, who um, you know, were, were key in the roles of, uh, of promoting and establishing a national bank. So, um, so yeah, so, so uh, but he, you know, of, of course, he also campaigned on ending slavery. So that was like the main sticking point. Uh, the South, uh, Southern states seceded. Um, there was, uh, you know, the attack at Fort Sumter and then obviously the Civil War happened and, um, and everybody knows what happened there. But, um, so, but as the Civil War was going on, um, it, he, uh, Abraham Lincoln realized that, you know, the war was costing a lot of money. And uh, so he decided to uh, redirect his priorities and, uh, and, uh, and establish uh, the National Bank as a way to help finance uh, the Union side for the uh, Civil War. And um, so he sold war bonds, he sold uh, securities. This helped finance the Civil War, Civil War for the Union side. Um, another thing, he established a national currency. Um, a lot of folks also don't realize that before Abraham Lincoln, uh, the United States didn't have a national currency like we do today. We had uh, different, we had a, a lot of different currencies. So like uh, different states would have different currencies. So for instance, the 
a currency that you had in Kentucky would be different than the currency that you would have in New York. Well, they, uh, with the National Bank under uh, Abraham Lincoln, they established a national currency so that we all had the same, uh, the same type of currency, which is a benefit that we, we, uh, that we still have to this day. Um, and let's see. And another thing is, oh yeah, and he, of course, he expanded uh, the railroad system. He used this to, um, to help him win the war as well, which was one of his uh, major priorities. Um, so he, it, they used the, rail, the Transcontinental Railroad to um, transport Union soldiers, uh, to transport resources that those soldiers would need to help win the war. But ultimately, he knew that even though he was using these things like the National Bank and the railroad system to help win the war, he knew that these were investments that would help benefit the country in the long term. Because these were the things that he originally campaigned on when he first ran for president. So these, these were things that he wanted to get done, Civil War or not. And um, just a few more things about the impact of the Transcontinental Railroad. It was the first uh, Transcontinental Railroad in the world. Um, they had railroads in Europe, but this was the first railroad that you know, spanned an entire continent. Um, it allowed uh, people to, uh, in addition to allowing people to travel, it allowed, uh, you know, we could transport goods from uh, mining communities, uh, transport steel and other things to help build communities in the cities. It allowed farmers to transport their goods uh, to other cities fast and efficiently. Um, it completely revolutionized the postal service. I mean, as you can imagine, we didn't have trucks or, of course, we didn't have any airplanes or anything back then. So, you know, if you wanted to mail something from New York to California, you would have to, the mail carrier would have to use a horse or, a, 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 you know, a, a series of horses. Um, and that would take a long, a long time. So the, the Transcontinental Railroad completely revolu revolutionized the postal service. Um, another thing that, um, that was done when Lincoln was president as was expanding the, the telegraph system. I know a lot of us think of telegraph as something that's old and antiquated, but back then it was like cutting edge technology. I mean, you can imagine um, like you could talk from, you could communicate with somebody from New York to, to California in a matter of seconds. I mean, that was, that was extremely cutting edge technology, something that was definitely needed. Um, and so in addition to all of these things, um, I th the thing that I think is the most important is it just completely revitalized cities um, and communities, uh, just allowed people to have, you know, have jobs and, uh, you know, get the resources, transport the resources that they, the raw materials that they were mining or uh, transport goods, import goods so that uh, they could, you know, process them and, and, and sell them. And it, it just completely revitalized cities all over the country. It was a huge investment, and uh, President Lincoln had the vision to, to see that, you know, even after the Civil War, this would be a huge investment for the American economy. And so I think the lesson that um, we can take from this is to just realize that even under the most trying times, we can still do great things. And um, I think that's uh, one thing that was true uh, when Lincoln was president, but it's also something that is true to this day. Thank you for those wise words, Carl, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for that uh, going forward. Uh, we'll have a couple of questions. I already see a question or two that's popped up that's uh, specifically towards Lincoln, and maybe between you and Ellen, we can get those answered here. Uh, once again, uh, we <clears throat> if you have a question, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll make sure we try our best to, to get those answered, uh, and we are already trying to figure out some of the answers to that and who would be best to respond. So keep the questions coming. Right now, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about FDR just because uh, our expert, Stephen Feinberg, who is the author of Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good, and uh, Brother Can You Spare a Billion, uh, is unable to join us uh, due to the uh, severe weather that we're having. He, is, uh, he has been locked out of uh, being able to uh, join us today. Uh, but I will refer anyone who's on the uh, webinar that we did a webinar on January 7th where 
Stephen went into great detail about uh, what FDR was able to accomplish at that time uh, and how that all went out. So if you want a more detailed answer, uh, please visit our uh, website, www.nlbcoalition.org or .com. And when you go there, you'll be able to see the January 7th webinar. Uh, with that being said, uh, I just want to touch a little bit on what FDR did uh, from 1933 to 1945. This was the last time we actually had uh, the National Bank uh, in place. And what uh, happened was it, Roosevelt obviously found him in the throes of the Great Depression, and he needed the ability to be able to spur the economy. Uh, the only way we have ever in this country been able to grow out of our debt is to be able to invest in ourselves, and he needed to be able to do that. And although he had put, placed a National Bank Act Her video is into off, Congress to be able to, she to is get on done, mute. Period. Um, but I still see her. Uh, somebody's talking, please mute yourself. Uh, with that being said, uh, uh, <clears throat> FDR tried to get it passed through the Congress, but was unable to. And so what he did was actually to be able to utilize the RFC, uh, which was the Refinance uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Finance Corporation, to be able to um, make um, the changes that and investment in this country that needed to happen. That thus was the birth of many of the alphabet soups that went on, uh, the Civil Works Administration, the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the Civilian Conservation Corps. <clears throat> All of them were known by their three letter acronyms but they were, what they enabled the country to do was to be able to put its people back to work. Because people going to work and being able to generate income not only for themselves, for, but for the projects that they did, that's how the economy was able to be able to uh, move forward and, and be able to do it. So it wasn't about making work, it was about actually investing in this country, making the, the decisions in this country that needed to get done and putting the money behind it to be able to do it. Much like today's bank, what we're talking about, the infrastructure has not been addressed in 60 years. And what we're hoping to be able to do with this bank is to be able to invest in ourselves again and to be able at that same time to be able to make sure that the opportunities are there uh, for all Americans across all 50 states uh, in every county, every city, every municipality. Uh, the thing I will tell you about the WPA, they built 125,000 new buildings, 20,000 uh, miles of water mains. Uh, the CCC built uh, 47,000 bridges and 200 large dams. They also, <clears throat> the PWA uh, built new bridges, new airports, also miles of, of streets. <clears throat> the, infra the National Infrastructure Bank, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation allowed uh, Roosevelt to be able to actually make the New Deal infrastructure investments that were necessary that saved the country and at the same time allowed the United States to be able to build all the um, machinery and defense investments that were necessary to be able to win World War II. If he wouldn't have started to invest in those uh, airport factories and the large engine plants to be able to do that we would have found ourselves in, at a great disadvantage when it came to fighting World War II uh, by actually investing in those uh, places, uh, the creation of the rubber industry, the, the uh, creation of uh, uh, an investment of large manufacturing plants throughout the nation. Those were the things at the end of the day that really uh, saved this country to be able to make that happen. Uh, and finally, the last thing I always, uh, some of the things that I think are really important are the large projects that uh, this bank was able to take on. You had the rural electrification uh, of the United States that basically happened during this period of time. You had <coughs> Hoover Dam, which was built to be able to do it, but that, that wasn't the only dam. There were dams built, uh, the Grand Coulee Dam, the Bonneville Dam, the Mississippi Flood Control Projects. And then, of course, the Tennessee 
Valley Authority, which tamed the Tennessee River and it enabled a whole area to be able to rise out of poverty and to be able to, to uh, at the end of the day, be able to start to be able to take care of itself and at the same time, be able to uh, invest in themselves and create a great economy going forward. <clears throat> I will not pretend to be an FDR expert. I have studied it. Uh, if you want the greatest details though, I suggest you go back and, and visit our uh, webinar again, the January 7th and let St uh, Stephen Fenberg really explain those details. But it's important to keep that in mind as we move forward here to be able to, uh, to do that. So now that we've kind of covered a little bit of the history the, the real question in, in a lot of people's minds is how do we make a national infrastructure bank possible going forward? And so I'm gonna ask uh, the politicians now that we have uh, gr so graciously joined us to be able to start helping us to be able to understand how do we move this idea from the drawing board actually into reality to make that happen. And I'm gonna ask uh, former Governor Roy Barnes from Georgia, if he wouldn't mind sharing us some of his uh, thoughts on that. Well, first, uh, the way I like to explain to folks uh, about the need for the infrastructure bank and the political problem that exists is, imagine what the home ownership would be if you had to save money and pay for a house all at one time. We know what has uh, revolutionized home ownership is a guarantee by the Federal Housing Administration, Fed, Fannie, Mae, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all of these. This is the same idea about uh, infrastructure. There is a great need for infrastructure and it has uh, ancillary benefits. One is employment that has been talked employment at, at good wages and we know that it works and when it and when when you do away with the bank you have a recession or a depression uh andrew jackson beat his chest and did away with the bank and then you had the panic of 1837 our first real depression and then they did away with it after lincoln and what did you have you had the depression of 1873 and so what we have here is something that actually works and it's been copied all over the world. One of the reasons that China is booming right now is that they have taken the whole idea of an infrastructure bank and they have created several of them and they're booming. They're bu building high speed rail, they're building all the infrastructure that is needed to support industry. And what we've done is we adopted the position, unfortunately, in Congress, well, we've got to pay as you go. If we don't have the money, then you can't do the infrastructure. And we know that by using credit, just like to buy a house, that you can build these large products, projects. Now, how do you pass this? How do you get it, uh, get it uh, into law? Well, the first thing that you do is you have to work with a bunch of politicians. Now, why would they be reluctant to do that? Why would they be reluctant to create something that has a proven track record of creating jobs and prosperity? Well, it's one of those things is if you pay as you go, then they can decide which projects get funded. And that's not good. And that goes to whoever has the political power, and there's not an overall plan that allows us, for example, to have a high-speed rail that would go from Florida all the way to the Northeast or across the country uh, in some ways, and to put broadband, just like we electrified uh, the nation through REA, Rural Electrification Administration, just like they use credit to do that, you can do it with broadband instead of saying, well, we'll do 10 miles this year and maybe we'll have enough money for five minutes. The political, uh, the political uh, import is this. 
And it's the most important thing, in my view, that President Biden will have to take up here. It, uh, this is the most important because it depends on whether we create jobs, build infrastructure for the future, uh, not just make jobs, but infrastructure that we truly need. And that is, if we do not contact and push from a local state level, that this is a good plan, it has worked in the past, then it won't happen. It just simply won't happen. It will die of inertia. And that would be, uh, be very tragic in my view. So we will talk uh, as we go through the questions and all about how to pull politics together, but we all know how to, what, uh, what makes politicians uh, react. Uh, number one is the hope of getting reelected. And we should have to articulate that we know this brings prosperity. And if they don't do it, then, you know, there will be political consequences. And then the second thing that we have to do is we have to get every stakeholder involved. And the, the, the ones that are going to be lent to mostly are government. Let's face it, you can, you're going to be able to lend to everything, but governments do not have the money. Their bonding capacity, and particularly after COVID, they simply do not have the money to undertake these huge projects. And they're interstate projects anyway, the large ones are. And we have to make sure that we build a coalition among local folks, state folks, and stakeholders to impress upon Congress that this is not only popular, but it will bring prosperity and it will get you reelected. So I'll stop there and follow up with some questions. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, next, we're going to ask Representative Kyle Mullins, who's uh, Pennsylvania House of Representatives, 112th District, uh, if he could share us uh, some of uh, the thing, his view from his perspective uh, in Pennsylvania. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, bearing with me. I promise this is riveting stuff, but my daughter Caroline, uh, despite my daughter Caroline uh, sleeping on me, it's tubby time for our older son. And uh, so I, we're, we're making it work as so many young families are. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a, a real honor to be uh, among this uh, distinguished and, and so well uh, versed and intelligent and experienced panel. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, thank you to my fellow panelists for um, you know, continuing to uh, educate us all on this uh, very important initiative. You know, um, the governor asked, you know, how do we get this done? And uh, I'd say Mr. Uh, Jack Hanna earlier in his presentation uh, really set us up for failure when he reminded us that Alexander Hamilton ba basically got things up and running in one day. Uh, it might take a little longer than that and perhaps a few more votes, but um, it's, I think it is our needs, our infrastructure needs uh, in this country uh, particularly uh, at this very moment when we need uh, uh, to stimulate the economy unlike uh, ever before uh, in our lifetimes um, uh, is it, so apparent. It, it's time to think uh, big once again. Uh, I know we, we talked about a number of distinguished former presidents. I'm happy to share a birthday that just passed with Abraham Lincoln. So I was smirking as uh, we were going, uh, as we were reviewing uh, Lincoln's experience, but uh, you know, another another one we look to uh, is shown over my shoulder here. Uh, John Kennedy uh, enabled us to uh, think big again. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that we uh, go to the moon tomorrow. I know there's uh, some of us who would probably want to go to the moon right now, and um, or some of us would want to send to the moon. I'm sure my wife would like to do that to me uh, any any day of the week. But um, in in a uh, in a very a ground level way. Um, I'm a state representative. I'm one of 203 members of the Pennsylvania uh, State House, and uh, you know we hear uh, all the time about the uh, condition uh, of our roads in Pennsylvania. The uh, American Society of Civil Engineers gives Pennsylvania a collective C minus um, for infrastructure, and uh, our, the rating of our roads is even worse. Um, and that's not where we want to be. Uh, I don't want you know, and I'm sure. Uh, Representative Sobecki over in uh, uh, Ohio understands and gets a lot of calls about uh, potholes, uh, but I think we should be um, investing uh, far, uh, far more. And I, I 
in our infrastructure, not just roads, but uh, you look at uh, the need for uh, the start need for uh, broadband uh, deployment in this country. Uh, so many uh, families right now grappling with um, the inability to connect to uh, remote learning. If we had a more robust uh, broadband uh, network in this country, we'd be uh, certainly doing uh, rural parts of our uh, state uh, a favor. So this is not just an urban center uh, uh, mass transit uh, thing. This is a this is a, a funding mechanism, a responsible one, uh, to make sure our debt is uh, that we are using something productive with our uh, national debt uh, and thinking big again. Not just putting people back to jobs, but uh, investing in the infrastructure, uh, below our feet, uh, and uh, and you know and here uh, here among us as we walk, but. The, um, you know, I'm from northeastern Pennsylvania, the, the coal beneath uh, our uh, feet at one point, the anthracite coal beds uh, helped to fuel the Industrial Revolution and, um, and, and, and aid in the war effort. Uh, but uh, we continue to try to find our way here uh, in, in areas like Scranton. Um, and uh, I, I think we, you know, there was a, a we are trying desperately to restore passenger rail to New York City. Once upon a time, they ripped up the rail lines, and we're trying to uh, undo that uh, because uh, there's there's a major economic uh, benefit to it. We just this would come in uh, so handy uh, here in so many other places. So, just that's just my uh, perspective for, as a state representative who's supportive of a resolution urging the Congress to pass this critical measure. Uh, but uh, and I'm sure uh, that uh, other members. Uh, like-minded members across the country feel the same way as well. So thank you very much for your time and it's, and it's good to be with you all. Thank you, Kyle, for that. Uh, Representative Lisa Sebecki is from Ohio uh, 45th District. Uh, and uh, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind sharing us your perspective from Ohio. Thank you, Bob. And, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us this evening. And first and foremost, I wanna wish everyone a happy um, President's Day. Uh, and you know, and this, this is a great opportunity for us not to only remember presidents, but also to have a conversation like we're having this evening about infrastructure. As many of our students across, not just the state of Ohio and Pennsylvania, but every one of our states, um, as kids couldn't learn about presidents um, in some areas because they didn't have broadband capabilities during this pandemic. So um, it's something that, that um, I've been looking at through the National Infrastructure Bank is, is, is speaking with my colleagues here in the state of Ohio is this is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. This is a United States of America issue. This is an issue that we need to really, we're looking at our infrastructure and we already know what's wrong with it. Um, the representative of uh, Mullins had mentioned uh, potholes. That's something that we have an issue with in the state of Ohio. But what happens is we just put little band-aids on them. But those band-aids can only be for so long that we have to turn them into tourniquets. And we're beyond tourniquets. This is actually a perfect time for us to have this conversation in the state of Ohio. It's we're getting ready to, um, we're debating and listening hearings on our transportation budget and how are we gonna be able to take care of our infrastructure in the state of Ohio? But we don't have the funds as a state to be able to really do what we need to do in our state. So what I've been doing is I've been meeting with Republicans and Democrats and talking about the Ohio issue that we have and how we can work with other states and uh, by investing and passing resolutions in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. I most recently this month invited you know, both sides of the aisle, the house um, to a webinar and they participated and um, listened to what a National Infrastructure Bank is. And in fact, that we'll go into many things here pretty soon, but of what they found was what the economists had to say around um, the infrastructure bank and how it works and understanding that, that I got, I got phone calls immediately after and during actually the webinar, thanking me for inviting them so they could learn more. And now that they've learned more, they've actually sponsored and joined on with my national infrastructure bank in the state of Ohio resolution. But we 
can't just talk to the state officials where I've been also speaking with my city council, with my um, uh, county commissioners, um, not just in my area, but in other areas throughout the state and talking with my other representatives to, to pass resolutions in their areas because this is grassroots. And, uh, you know, I, like Bob, Lynn always says, and I've heard him say this for as long as I've known him though, is um, when things aren't going good, you, you watch he's gonna run to the, or I'm paraphrasing, you watch he runs to the front of the, the parade to take all the credit for it, a bunch of politicians. But we need to, um, you know, we have to start this grassroots effort. And it's also not just talking to politicians, it's talking to my neighbors about the infrastructure bank because they're tired in our local locale area that uh, we have to, you know, talk levies and, and raise our property taxes to be able to pay for those potholes in those streets that are just going to get another Band-Aid or a tourniquet that can't get, you know, it's only so big that you really have to do something. And the National Infrastructure Bank just to take care of roads and bridges, it builds high-speed rail, it offers the opportunity for broadband, it also takes care of our low income housing. And there's another element of that is that it will expand in our schools. Because if you think about it, the kids that are entering, that went, the kindergartners that entered school this year, graduate in 2033. We have to have someone to be able to maintain it. And we also know that coming out of the pandemic, there's gonna be retooling that's gonna be done. Because I personally know of businesses that aren't gonna be coming back online once we go back to what we call normal. So their employees are gonna to need to have find a job. Well, here's a perfect opportunity for us to create jobs and be able to put people to work. And then they can um, retire with dignity and retire and have benefits. How great would it be that we are putting 25, we could 25 million people to work, if not more, because that splinters out in other areas. So I'm just really excited for you to put your questions and answers in your questions, excuse me, in the question box. And, and we're going to continue to work. And we want to work beside you that are on this, that's learning more about it. So um, I'll be quiet now, but uh, just thank everybody for taking the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so now we're going to move on to some of the questions. And, and one of the questions uh, is for Ellen Brown. Ellen, uh, they, <clears throat> they're talking about, they wanna know what the state of public banking is. I know that we currently have uh, at least one state bank in North Dakota, and I thought we had one in Rhode Island, but can you kind of give us an idea of what that is and then how that can actually work and mesh with uh, our concept of out of a national infrastructure bank? Yeah, well, yes, we only have one, the Bank of North Dakota, unless yes. you have the, America, the Bank of American Samoa, which was, uh, I think it was chartered two years ago, and it took them two years to get a credit line with the Federal Reserve. You know, it's, it's so we've been working on this for 10 years. <laughs> I think we've got 25 or so bills actively being pursued right now. We have several new ones that have just come on the line and two in New York and uh, we've got California and I, I'm not aware of a, what was the other place you said? <laughs> I'm not aware of a public bank there. But, uh, I, I had heard, I had heard Rhode Island, but yeah, I could I be wrong. Think so. no, um, yeah. Anyway, so, so the whole idea of a public bank is we the people would be, we'd take our own money, which is be our state money, our city money, whatever the local community is, put it in our own bank and leverage it the way banks do. Um, so uh, I can just talk for a minute about the Bank of North Dakota. It was, it was um, funded in 1919 uh, or chartered. And so it's been around for over a hundred years now. And it's, there was an article in the, um, Wall Street Journal in 2014 that said that the Bank of North Dakota was more profitable than J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs. And the way they do that is they cut out the middleman, so they don't have um, their profits aren't being bled off to, sh to shareholders. They don't have high-paid CEOs, 
and uh, they so they take their own funds and leverage them into the community and they they do not compete with the local banks they actually partner with the local banks so the local bank uh, the banking association endorses the bank of north dakota they all work together very well um, for example with the ppp payouts or it's in se several uh, programs for covid relief they have been number one in the country because they just they they have a facility for for delivering all this stuff because they have a, a public banking network that works through their local community banks they have more community banks per capita than in any other state um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention that I, just I've heard from from the discussion I would think people are asking where is the money going to come from for this public bank so so the first thing you have to realize about banking and what really got me into this is when I realized this is that banks actually create our money supply. And so that's why we want our own bank. We want to be able to borrow from the Federal Reserve at 0.25% like private banks can. As of last March, the Fed opened their discount window for all banks in good standing to borrow at 0.25%. So that's a quarter of a percent, like that's almost nothing. Um, Banks create, are allowed to create 10 times as many loans as they have capital. And I know your plan for capitalization is to um, basically get bondholders, individuals or businesses that, or like whatever pension funds that already have bonds to get them to subscribe to the infrastructure bank and you'd pay 2% on top of that. Um, anyway, so basically what we'd be doing is generating our own credit, which is what banks do. According to the Bank of England in 2014, banks um, create 97% of the money supply and 97% of the UK money supply anyway, and ours is almost that high. So this bank would be creating credit and then when you the check goes out, you have to clear it. You have to get the liquidity from somewhere. So what the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did was to issue bonds and sell bonds. And that's what this bank could do too. But ideally, it seems to me, we would tap up the Federal Reserve at 0.25%. So we can borrow for almost nothing if we are a bank. And that's why we want to set this up as a bank. Well, uh, uh, th those are uh, great answers. And, and somebody did reply in the in the question that Rhode Island actually does have an infrastructure bank, it's www.riib.org. So. Oh, okay. Well, California has one of those too, but they're not depository banks. What we're talking about is a depository bank because if you are a depository bank, then you are allowed to create credit on your books. Gotcha. Are, yeah, okay. So they're well, that, all that, funds. That, Ours in California is also a revolving fund, you know, where they start with 300, they've got $300 million and they lend it out. They've got like 20 times as many, um, whatever, businesses competing for that money. There's 20 times the demand as the amount of money that they have. So if they took that 300 million, turned it into capital, they could then make 3 billion in loans. That's what a bank is allowed to do, lend 10 times as much as they have in capital. There you go. And see that now you've answered a question that I think uh, a lot of people didn't understand about the bank that we're proposing to be able to do it. Because uh, another oh, yeah. question so came in. Just, go ahead. It would be a depository bank. So it would have the perks of a depository bank. That's the difference. Yep. Right. And, and, and that's that's what we're trying to propose here. And, and somebody had asked in, in, as one of the questions is, uh, why don't we use treasuries uh, the current debt that's out there, and that, that actually is the plan uh, of the National Infrastructure Bank, is to actually go and uh, collect the treasuries that are outstanding, the 20, uh, a portion of the uh, $27 trillion that are out there in that national debt, to be able to collect them and use that as our starting capital to be able to finance the bank. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about um, opening it up to private investors and and all the other people who have all kinds of money to be able to continue to expand on this. We're actually talking about remonetizing our federal debt to be able to use that as the seed money to then be able to use the National Infrastructure Bank and be able to do that. 
Uh, Ellen, I know you have to get off the phone here. Is there anything else you'd like to add before you have to leave us today? Um, I, the, I'm sure Alfeca knows <laughs> the answers to everything I know, but okay, thank you. The, the, actually, I got choked up when um, the, the, just hearing about Pennsylvania. My relatives are from Pennsylvania and you know, farmers in Pennsylvania. I mean, I, I think what their country is so divided right now, but the one thing that we all have in common is the constitution, the bill of rights, our history as a nation, which is really a, a very inspiring history. And if we can continue that with this National Infrastructure Bank, I just think that is, I mean, it does my heart good. <laughs> it's just something we need right now. Yeah. Yeah. We'll back to see us in Pennsylvania anytime, Ellen. <laughs> And, and Ellen, uh, if people want to know more about if there's uh, uh, the public bank uh, options in the other states that are going on, could you just share your website really quickly with them? Because a couple of people asked. Yeah, publicbankinginstitute.org. And we have a lot of information on there and details on each of the, of the bank bills that are active right now and the ones that aren't active too. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, uh, we're going to continue on with some of the questions we have here. So yeah, moving on. Yeah. Great work. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Ellen. Uh, moving on. Uh, we, uh, a, a few people have asked um, why, uh, let me get it here just to get it. Do we have a CBO score yet on the bill? Uh, and so Alfeca, I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, share with uh, uh, our listeners what we have uh, accomplished so far and uh, where we stand on, on in terms of that. Right. Thanks very much. So CBO scores, which are scores or measures of the economic impact of a piece of legislation uh, that are done by the Congressional Budget Office, usually happen a little bit later in a piece of legislation's history uh, or development. Uh, so a scoring has not been done on this bank. However, we do have some really great modeling work that was done by the University of Maryland, which does effectively the same thing and even does it a little bit better. It does it by something called dynamic assessments. But essentially what this, uh, this modeling, where this modeling came from was the American Association of Manufacturers uh, some time ago, and then just recently, the, uh, um, the Association, the American Society of Civil Engineers asked for studies to be done on what would be the effect of spending an additional dollar on infrastructure of investment? What effect would that have on the economy? Uh, and all those models were able to show that uh, $1 spent would plow back into the economy and add an additional three to $7 in additional GDP that would, be, that would come out of this uh, investment. And uh, that would also, not only would GDP be boosted, but uh, also disposable income would be boosted and all this would be done, uh, would, would increase uh, uh, disposable incomes, but would not in, in, increase or uh, contribute to rising inflation. So the effect, the, the bottom line is effectively, the scoring has been done by this modeling by the University of Maryland. Thank you for that answer, uh, Alfeca. Uh, a couple other questions that have come in, uh, I just wanna make sure that uh, you're aware of. Uh, as we go on today, <clears throat> This is being recorded and will be available for anybody to be able to then uh, refer back to and uh, be able to actually share with friends and, and other people uh, who need to, to know the answers as to what's going on. So uh, people have asked for transcripts. People have asked uh, if it'll be a shareable link. All that will happen after this is done, uh, probably within the next 48 hours. So you'll be able to have that to be able to move on from there. Um, <clears throat> If, if we can move on here to a, another question. Uh, <clears throat> if the object of the bank is to serve public interest and common good, what safeguards are enumerated in the proposed legislation so that private industry doesn't game the system uh, so that the elites are the only ones to benefit from it? And it, it, what is it looking at alternative economic system uh, uh, such a, so that they don't, ex, uh, let me get this right, I apologize. It looks to alternative economic systems that do not depend on ever expanding economy that depletes the finite resources of the earth, uh, such as fossil fuel. So we're looking at uh, New Deal 
our new green deals, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> Governor, if you wouldn't mind uh, just talking about some of the benefits uh, and how do we control that? That's all within a legislative process. So, Sure. Uh, one of the things that, um, and you have to have controls on anything. Uh, there is on Fannie Mac, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, uh, the FHA and everything else, there are controls. But remember this, most of this money, if I were still governor, I would go to the infrastructure bank and say, listen, I got the fifth fastest growing state in the nation. Uh, and I need water badly. I need new water resources. I mean, look at Flint, Michigan. That's been four years ago, and they still haven't gotten their water system fixed. Now, that's, that's disgraceful. Uh, that would be perfect for something like this. But all of the, uh, the projects that you're undertaking are uh, go toward cutting down the carbon footprint. You mass transit, which keeps everybody from having to drive their own car as they go along. Uh, the, in, the improvement for uh, the improvement for water and sewer. And the idea that they should be sensitive to the uh, environment is part of it. And it would, should be part of the mandate that, that occurs. But that, that can, those safeguards can be built into that and will be built in today. It's a lot better coming from here, from one central source, to be able to have the, uh, these incentives to be more environmentally friendly than you have all these private banks everywhere scattered throughout the state without one common goal. This is a way to, to put together one common goal. Listen. I learned a long time ago that you have to, to get anything done, you, you have to have an intersection of what I call, you have to have an intersection of good policy. And I hate to say this, but greed, because this is a capitalistic society and this provides the money that states can take undertake these big projects with and also the businesses come along and want the work, which employ the workers at a Davis-Bacon wage that makes that creates good jobs. And so, yes, that is a concern, but it is it is one that it can easily be accomplished through this. In traditional banking, though it has its flaws, we have what's called the community reinvestment, where You've got to serve everybody in the community and just, just not the elite. Well, that's going to apply here too. I mean, you are a bank and that Community Reinvestment Act is enforced by the Fed where you're going to be going to their window to borrow money. So there's going to be safeguards built in, but it should be part of the mandate also. Thank you, Governor. Um, at Looking at a couple more questions here, I have one for Jack Hanna. Jack, um, they uh, are asking, what is the National Infrastructure Bank, why is it a better solution than a state infrastructure? And what are some of the advantages that a national uh, infrastructure bank would have? If you wouldn't mind addressing that. Uh, happy to do so, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, uh, there are infrastructure projects and tasks that need be addressed throughout the entire country. And um, several or many or most of those straddle state lines. It's a huge uh, task uh, and effort in order to develop high-speed rail, which uh, uh, is uh, an interstate commerce project uh, that will travel across the country. We also have, as has been mentioned before, several communities in desperate need of improvement of their water supplies and, and also sewage systems. This is a national problem that confronts many uh, communities and cities throughout the entire United States. Uh, and 
In addition, we have a, a huge challenge with regard to uh, uh, our communication system and broadband. And at this point in time, we have uh, 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 corporations that are not willing to invest in broadband development in rural communities. Uh, and they are being left to the side of the road as far as our uh, 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 nation is concerned going forward. This cannot continue to happen. And a national infrastructure bank is able to address all of those needs in, in a way that is more efficient than, than having it be conducted piecemeal because of the economies of scale and the ability to standardize technological developments in order for the broadband development, in order for the water systems to be improved, the sewage systems to be improved, and the high-speed rail systems. Uh, in addition, there's other uh, means and mechanisms that a national bank can employ that's not local, uh, that uh, it, it enables it to be the most effective means by which to have uh, the largest uh, economic uh, infrastructure tasks be addressed. So uh, uh, I answer the question in that fashion. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, uh, can I, can I add absolutely. That? Go ahead, Governor. Uh, I want to give you an example. Uh, as I said, Georgia is a fast-growing state uh, and has a lot of needs. I um, mean, there's no question. We, we created... Uh, several years ago, what was called the Georgia Environmental Facilities Authority to do water and sewer because these governments just couldn't afford to do all this. Uh, those of you that are in this business know water makes money, sewer loses money. You put them together and hopefully pay, even and pay your debt service. Even with that, and it's been very successful uh, in Georgia, but even with that, when Atlanta, Atlanta has or had a combined sewer overflow system, that was what was done a hundred years ago, where you put sanitary sewer and storm water in the same pipe and just hope that it dilutes it enough. We could not cover that project because it was so large. And just like Jack said, you, these things are even if they're contained within the state, they're so large that beyond the uh, ability of a state to have a state infrastructure base and create that mass, that scale that is necessary to do it. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Kyle Mullins, uh, there's a question here that talks about uh, right now, some states wind up uh, going and luring businesses away from other states with tax incentives, et cetera. It, it, with the National Infrastructure Bank, what could be some of the positives out of the National Infrastructure Bank that could help keep companies in your community and be able to invest in, in that area? You know, I think it's a great question. And I think the uh, Infrastructure Bank uh, as modeled could um, address each state's individual and unique uh, needs. Uh, without, you know, without some of the uh, issues you, uh, you mentioned. Again, we have, uh, depending on uh, your climate, depending on uh, your population, depending on your topography, depending on so many factors uh, we have, each state has uh, different needs and will need uh, more or less of the ultimate uh, proceeds and projects from uh, a would-be uh, national infrastructure bank. I think it helps uh, to level the playing field to understand that uh, you know every state will be on an you know, even footing uh, for uh, these for the opportunity for these uh, projects, and that there will be a uh, you know a a, a national uh, arbiter or overseer of these of these dollars and these investments. And I hope so. I hope I, I captured the the essence of the question well. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Representative and, Sebek. And forgive me, as no, I, I I must uh, I must hop off and put two of my youngest constituents to bed. Uh, uh, thank you very much I, for uh, joining us tonight, Representative. I'd like my wife to vote for me again. So everyone have a, yep. have a good night. Thank you so All much. Right. Thanks. Um, uh, next, uh, <clears throat> uh, Carl, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, being one of the younger presenters on this uh, panel, if you wouldn't mind giving us 
uh, what benefits and, and why as a young person, why, how can we excite the young people to get involved in this effort and be able to do it? What can you uh, offer advice to be able uh, uh, to the young people out there, why we need a national infrastructure bank? Well, in my opinion, um, it helps lower the unemployment rate. And I think that would be crucial for, um, you know, I mean, if you are, let, let's say you are, uh, you are deciding not to attend college because not everybody, you know, it's great, it's great if you're going to college, but not everybody, um, college isn't for everybody, you know? And even if you do go to college, you understand that college isn't for everybody. And so you just out of, um, you know, empathy for, you know, your fellow person, you would want to make sure that everybody has a good job. And that's what the infrastructure, the National Infrastructure Bank does. It ensures that uh, those who would like a good paying job can receive a good paying job. And it's a, and not only that, but it's a job with dignity. You know, I mean, it's, it's a job where you can be proud of what you do. And um, I think that would just be good for the, the national morale and, uh, you know, just, just help and, and, and the improvements that we would see in the future, uh, people could say, you know, people could tell their kids and their grandkids that, hey, I was a part of that. And I think that that's important. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Representative Lisa Sebecki, uh, there was a question about broadband and, and trying to make sure it gets included to, to all the rural areas. And I know you've been on the call several times with Erica, and since she's not here, uh, I know you, you are our quasi-expert on how we can expand broadband and, and uh, be able to do that. Still with us, Lisa? Mm, okay. Well, I guess we'll move on. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, is really important that we talk about here is uh, to make sure that the uh, infrastructure loans to understand how they will work. At the end of the day, we're talking about loans to municipalities, cities, and every ability uh, to be able to uh, everyone who owns the <clears throat> infrastructure to be able to, to, to borrow the money to be able to do that. And so it would be very, it's very important. And, and one of the things that uh, we had talked about a little bit is how do we build uh, the momentum here? And we, we talked about grassroots and, and somebody asked, well, uh, how do we do that? And, and I'm going to suggest that everyone that's on this uh, webinar has somebody that they know um, or belongs to an organization that needs to know about this. And we encourage you all to get, uh, to one, get educated on this and be able to, to, to make that happen. And two, uh, we're asking that it goes up in the, uh, <clears throat> if you get it passed in your organization, and what we're asking is for you to get a resolution passed in support of this, uh, <clears throat> of the National Infrastructure Bank, encouraging Congress to pass it and then President Biden to sign it and enact it so that we can get this made. Uh, one of the things that I know Lisa was talking about is we need to build the parade so that at the end of the day, the politicians will happily run to the front to be able to take credit from it. A lot of times that's how things get done. It's usually a small group of people who are highly motivated to be able to do anything. And, and they're the ones that are actually the ones that make things happen at the end of the day. And that's what we're asking you, uh, all the people who are on uh, this call, to be able to start to learn that and be able to do it. Uh, one of the other questions that uh, we're going to get to here, and, and I want to do it, we're, we're now coming to the end of this. And I want to just share with you that we have a number of, of groups that are currently uh, sponsoring this statewide, et cetera. And so <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind, uh, showing us the um, screen here. These are the states who have had resolutions that have been put in uh, to be able to do it. Some of them are in various stages of being passed uh, and uh, some have uh, uh, new resolutions that have just been added to be able to do that. Virginia has since done it. 
Uh, they are currently in the process of doing it. But you can see on the screen that there are several states that have legislation that was proposed that can uh, go into it. Uh, in addition, there are counties that have done it. I know that Westchester, New York, uh, just recently uh, went and had it adopted. Uh, I know that here in the Toledo area, we have uh, uh, done with uh, our TIMACAD, the Toledo Metropolitan Area Council of Governments, uh, our city council has passed it, et cetera. And so there are lots of things that are doing. There also are <coughs> labor unions who have endorsed it to be able to do that. So if you belong to a labor union and you're able to get that uh, passed in that group, again, it's, it's about doing something, albeit small, but it's important that everyone does their small part because that's how you make things go and get bigger. And so at the end of the day, uh, anything you can do to be able to help that go on. Uh, if you, uh, uh, the next screen, uh, we have um, other groups that have done it. And those uh, include uh, uh, organizations and National Association of Counties, um, uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, Democratic Party, National Association of Minority Contractors. There's, there's a whole slew of groups and every one of you belongs to something and I would encourage you to get involved in that. Uh, and finally, the, the last two things I want to share with you are the YouTube. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and all the webinars are on there. Uh, so you can get all the details that are there. So if you want to go back and review your notes and, and see what happened and didn't happen to be able to do that. And also uh, <clears throat> there is our website. And on our website, we have on there the ability for um, <clears throat> webinars, but also has the bill itself as a summary of the bill uh, and uh, the quick notes so that uh, you can be able to uh, uh, share that with people that's going on. And it also has a frequently asked questions section. And so those are some of the important things that just to educate yourself to be able to do it. A final thing I will say is that we are available to be able to help anybody who wants to, to uh, reach out to a group and needs some backup. We are willing as a group to be able to come on and do Zoom phone calls or uh, webinars to be able to, or a short uh, discussion to be able to, a presentation to be able to talk to any group that's there. Uh, that's all we need is uh, somebody to open the door, uh, and provide the introduction, give us uh, 15, 20 minutes of their time, and uh, we will gladly make sure experts such as Alfeca and, and others in the group can get on the phone call and answer their specific questions and details. I realize I didn't get to all the questions that are on there. <clears throat> there are some of the questions that are on there that uh, are available on the website and we will be uh, making sure that those answers get out there as soon as possible. With that being said, I'm gonna let Governor Roy Barnes close this out tonight and give us a good send off so that we are inspired to go out do everything possible to make this a reality. So, Governor. Well, I don't know if I, I can inspire, but I will tell you this. Uh, this works. How do we know it works? Because we've tried it in the past, and it's worked every time that we have. We know it works because every, we've had nations all over the world that have copied it, and they are now very competitive and advancing. And so what we have to do here is, and Bob's exactly right. Let me tell you the, uh, you know, politicians do, as soon as there's a, a, a big crowd, they're going to get in front of it and, and lead it. Uh, I, I guess it's Voltaire says, there go my people. Let me find out where they're going so I may lead them. And what happens is if we get, if we create enough ground support, and get enough buzz going with these groups that we've had business, labor, and cities and counties that have groups here uh, that are involved in this and interested in it. This is accomplishable. And when you talk to legislators or members of Congress or anything else, don't let them glass over. Just tell them, says, listen. You can't pay for a house all at one time. 
and neither can you pay for a high-speed rail all at one time. You've got to put it over a period of time and allow us to eat that elephant one bite at a time. That's what we need to do. And that's what we ask you to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. Everyone have a wonderful evening. And again, thank you for joining us tonight.